Wonderful. Well, hi, I am Mistress Alice McIntosh from the East Kingdom. For the past three years and change, I have been Pelican Queen of Arms. Uh, and I thought it would be a good idea to just hold a session where people could ask me questions about the process, about the job, about what's going on in uh, various things that are brewing in the college. Um, so I'll give you two minutes on who I am and then open up the floor for questions so that I can keep track of questions. I'm asking people to put them in the chat, but there may be questions that are more of a, that involve more of a conversation. So you may, and I'm trying not to talk with my hands in front of the camera. Uh, so uh, you may from time to time want to unmute yourselves so that we can have a conversation. Okay, so I got into heraldry around a. Uh, let me back up a second. I've been in the SCA since 1989, uh, primarily doing rapier. Uh, I started doing heraldry in uh, AS40 for what during my first catastrophic knee injury, and uh, and the rest is history. A bunch of us got together and decided to do a uh, commenting group. Some of them you might have heard of, that being uh, Lilia and Brutusend, my predecessor as Pelican and Cormac's predecessor as Wreath. So I think we did okay for ourselves. My particular research specialty is uh, Scottish, Middle English, and Medieval French. I have a on a whim, my second major in college was French literature, and who knew that I'd end up using that more than I actually use my college degree. All right, so let's uh, open the floor. Have at. Oh no, is everyone too frightened to say anything? Really, I haven't actually bitten anyone in years. Yeah. But when's the last time you made someone cry? Um, in a good way or a bad way? Whichever you want to tell us about. I have to say the last time I made somebody cry in a good way was uh, probably during a peerage speech for someone's elevation. Can't remember the last time I was required to make someone cry to ensure their compliance. What have been some of the harder decisions during your tenure as Pelican? I really hate the uh, obtrusive modernity uh, ones uh, because they end up being the very close calls. Um, Obtrusive modernity and uh, whether someone is important enough to protect from presumption. Particularly when it's a figure from a culture that is not well represented in easily available Western materials. We had at least one either Japanese, I know we had a Japanese and a Chinese painter that I had to go uh, really searching to find information about to decide whether that person was important enough to protect. Uh, let's see. 
Lily Doove asks, how do you handle names that are from languages in a different script? Uh, well, they all have to be transliterated into uh, Latin characters. So anything that's in Russian or Arabic or Hebrew, for example, has to be transliterated and I rely on my subject matter experts to tell me whether the transliteration makes sense and is consistent. Uh, no pelican knows every language that's going to come up. And uh, it's, Uh, you have to rely on the people who have really made it their study to explain uh, the things specific to that language. Hang on, I've got a couple of people coming in. Okay. Uh, Elspeth asks, how is the non-European names project going? A little more slowly than I wanted it to. Uh, some life stuff for me came up and has limited some of my not decision time. Um, but I'm going to be working with my successor to get that up and running. All right, Maddock asks, given the variations in spelling in period, why is spelling such an emphasis item in name submissions? Um, because not every variation in spelling is created equal. There are some variations in spelling that are uh, absolutely found in period. But there are some that are not. For example, the most famous example is the IY swap that appears in uh, French, English, Scots, and a couple other languages. That is well attested, but you don't, for example, find in English K and Q being swapped. So not every weird spelling variant that a submitter may ask for actually has support in period practice. That being said, if your submitter wants, uh, if your submitter wants a weird spelling variant, you handle it by going out and finding examples of that spelling variant actually being used. For example, someone wants Isabella spelled with only one L. Well, you go look at a lot of different records from a lot of different time periods or articles that people have already written and see whether you find Isabella in the same kind of records with one L or two or Christabel with one L or two or similar you know, or Amabel or Mabel with one L or two, and then present that evidence. The easiest way, uh, the easiest way to get any strange thing that your submitter wants is to show it was actually done in period. And let me tell you, period naming data is far weirder than we think. Uh, does that, was that actually, Maddock, was that actually answering the question you were asking? Yeah, for the most part. Um, but like the, the Isabella example you gave, I, I guess my question is, what's the, what's the biggest difference between Isabella with one L and Isabella with two Ls that would, that would make it such an emphasis to go out and find period examples, as opposed to just saying it, it doesn't change the sound so what, what the heck? Uh, because sometimes it does change the sound. Remember, we're not talking about modern English. Uh, and because 
the point of the whole exercise is recreation. So we want to show that things were actually done or not done. Uh, and we want to try to do that based on actual examples in text. If you look at decisions and if you go search name decisions and look at, say, interpolated as your search term in Morsalis, you'll find instances where we do interpolate spellings from attested spellings, but we need those data examples to work from before we'll do it. Uh, because we're trying to recreate the way things were actually done. And if we have records, we want to use them. All right. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Lily. Lily Duve asks, are there scripts that are not easily transliterated? Um, well, Hebrew and Arabic is always going to be a little bit of a crapshoot in transliteration because they don't like vowels. Um, I'm sure there are others. It really depends on the level of expertise we have accessible in that language. Um, we have people who can read Cyrillic characters, so that transliteration isn't difficult. The bigger problem is when we get into scripts in, say, Tamil or another language from the Indian subcontinent where we don't have a subject matter expert. And well, we're working on finding those. Uh, does that pretty much answer what you were looking for? Okay. Uh, how has my day job influenced how I've done my work and submissions? Uh, for those who have no idea what my day job is, uh, I am an attorney. I am specifically a litigation attorney, and it has absolutely influenced how I do my work in submission in submissions. Um, because I approach the questions I'm being asked to answer very much like judges approach the questions they're being asked to answer. I don't want to give advisory opinions that are not the question in front of me. I want to rule on the case in front of me in as narrow a way as I have to. And that's just built into the way I think about these things and I can't help it. Uh, I don't like sort of leaving stray thoughts out there that someone can jump on and go, but she said this. Uh, in law, that's called dicta. And it's not persuasive. So I said, mostly it means I try to keep my decisions focused on the issue I have to decide to get the job done and not go beyond it. Uh, Cormac already eyeing the door, says, other than don't do it, what would you tell those who are considering a bid for a future position as Pelican saw? Honestly, I wouldn't say don't do it. Uh, being Pelican was way easier than being Blue Tiger Submissions Herald for the East. Uh, what I would tell the people who are considering a bid for a future position as Pelican is practice writing because you have to write a lot on fairly short notice. Uh, read, a, read the LOARs a lot to get a sense of the style and what kinds of things need to go into decisions. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know a huge number of languages yourself but know who you're going to call on. Be able to get along with people well enough that you can call on the subject matter experts who are out there and they will take your emails. 
um, and deadlines. Be able to write to deadlines because every month it rolls over and every month you got to go back to it. Uh, given the length of our meetings, I would also say uh, a sturdy bladder. Serafina asks, how do you make decisions on names that you have limited knowledge on and the college has limited information on? Oh yeah, those are the situations I hate. Indian, Indian subcontinent names are kind of where we're at with that. In that we have very limited knowledge. We don't really have any subject matter experts. And there's not a lot of information out there in translation. So I end up hitting up people who aren't necessarily Skadian, but have some information in that area. Um, I end up doing a lot of independent research or sending other people out to do independent research. And then I just go with giving the submitter the benefit of the doubt. If the submitter and their consulting herald and commenters have made a good case and we have no reason to believe that it's not true, let them have it and you can all, and write the decision as narrowly possible as possible so you don't make bad precedent that someone has to reverse later. And then go encourage people to go write more articles on other things. All right, Cormac again. What skill do you lack that would make the role of Pelican easier? I do not suffer fools well. <laughs> uh, I would like to be more patient with 12 hour meetings. I would like I, I, I would like to swear a little less in my proto decisions. <laughs> uh, Patricia. Hi, Patricia. How many sources do you generally need to accept some new to us kind of name construction? If someone found one scholarly article that says there is an alternative period way that a woman would have said of Trakai in her native language, is that enough? Well, a lot of that depends on the article. The general rule of thumb is we like to see three examples of something to show that it's an actual pattern and not a fluke or a unique way of referring to a unique personage. Uh, for instance, I've got uh, a friend who is not a herald, but has been doing a lot of research work in Tamil poetry. And Tamil is one of the languages from the Indian subcontinent. And she's starting to try to write me an article based on the names that appear in the Tamil poetry she's working on. And she has all week been sending me a, well, how do I figure out naming patterns question? And well, there's this one guy that they name this way. And, and what does that mean? So really, we need enough examples, and that's usually three, to know that it's not unique to that individual. Or you know, and some of it depends on how much other information we have in that field. We're going to need a lot more evidence of a pattern in medieval French than we are going to need in Tamil. <laughs> All right, Allison has a comment about understanding the role of precedent. Uh, Frida has a question. Just how much skill is required for someone to be considered a subject matter expert for the Heralds? Um, 
more than anyone else. <laughs> uh, if you are the only person who knows anything about, say, Czechoslovakian, you've just become my subject matter expert. Um, generally, I'm when I say subject matter experts, I'm looking for the people who have really dug in to some degree on the issue, have done more than just done a couple Google Books searches. I'm looking for the people who may speak the language, even if they haven't done any name-specific research in it. Um, there's no specific, like, where I set the bar, in some instances, it's no more than I do. <laughs> and that's good enough. Are all decisions that have explanations considered precedents? Yes. A decision without explanation really doesn't have any persuasive value. There has to be an explanation for it to be able to, for you to be able to use that decision to argue what the next result should be. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm looking at Lily not vaguely nodding her head in the, uh, you know, if I just accept without comment, you have no idea what went on in my head. You can't say, okay, well, because this was accepted, we should continue to, we should accept this other thing. I, am I making any sense at all? Okay, good. What types of primary and secondary resources are appropriate for heraldic research? Well, all primary sources are acceptable for heraldic research if they record a name because they were written in the time period. So if we can say this name was recorded in this time and place, well, that's proof that the name was recorded there in that time and place. Secondary resources, Anything, sh I'm just going to, anything short of a primary source, what we're looking for are dates and spellings that are original or look close to the original as it was recorded. What a lot of modern history books do is, um, modernize or normalize spellings. The example I use all the time is that there was a queen of Jerusalem after the first crusade whose name in all of the modern history books, and I'm gonna write this out in the chat window, is spelled that way as uh, Melisande. However, in no actual period document written contemporaneously with her is her name spelled that way. For some reason, the Victorians decided that her name was spelled Melisande, and that's become the popular historical spelling that you find in you know, your general popular history books about the Crusades. And we have to do all kinds of contortions and late period literary names to get that spelling. So what you want for a non-primary source, and, and, and even as Allison points out in the comment, uh, oh, there's like 17 different ways I'm gonna do some of the, Some of the most common. Um, so you want, hang on, I'm backing up. So you want dates 
and spellings that look consistent with other period spellings. Things that look like they didn't normalize or standardize names. Now, what I hate is when somebody takes a perfectly good primary source, leaves the surnames in their original form, but updates all the given names to, to modern spellings for some reason. Deeply frustrating. Uh, British History Online, while it has a lot of great primary sources with surnames still in their original form, updates the given names. Rini and Wilson, if it's not italicized, has updated the given names to modern forms. Deeply frustrating. Uh, Elizabeth, did that answer your question really about how to evaluate sources? Or would you like a little more detail? Okay. Uh, Maddock follows up and say, Ray, Patricia's question, can it be three examples from the same article if the names are different? Yes, if you've got three different people named in an article using the same pattern, that's your three examples. It doesn't need to be three articles. It just needs to be three examples of the pattern in use to show that it's not a fluke. Uh, you mentioned Pelican being less work than Blue Tiger. What are some of the ways that making and writing decisions as Pelican differ from that aspect as a submissions herald? Um, well, you can't dodge anything as Pelican. You can't go, well, I don't know anything about Indian, so I'm gonna just send that up and let someone else deal with it. Uh, you can't dodge offensiveness, you can't dodge presumption. You have to make a decision. And in that respect, it is harder than Blue Tiger. The reason why Blue Tiger was so much work was because I would, also taking submissions at the same time. Uh, and got called on to do a lot of things by crowns because our principal herald wasn't a book herald, he was just a vocal herald. So I was the crown's go-to book herald for, oh, let's create, let's create a dozen new orders. <laughs> Which meant that, so I, my it was Blue only Tiger, half a dozen. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So only a half a dozen new orders. Uh, so it ended up being more than just the submissions work on the Blue Tiger end that was making that job more difficult than being sovereign. Um, da -da -da -da. Otter asks, what attracts me to onomastics versus armory? Uh, well, I can't draw. Um, I have always been fascinated by language and names. Um, I think this goes back to reading Tolkien at a very, very young age. Uh, <laughs> and like everyone of a certain bent who... Uh, read Tolkien at a very, very young age, learned Elvish. And uh, I like language. It's what led me to being a lawyer. And uh, I actually get to use what I studied in college and how often can any of us say that? All right. What sort of behind the scenes help makes the job of Pelican easier? Well, the first thing that behind the scenes makes the job of Pelican easier is um, Ragged Staff. Uh, Serafina goes through and goes and looks at all the forms to make sure that all the information I need to make the name decisions is gets into Oscar before my meeting. So we find out if there's an authenticity request that wasn't mentioned in the letter of intent. 
or if there's a conflict between what's written on the form and what's in the letter of intent in Oscar, which is a huge help because trying to discern what the submitter actually wants is just crazy making and having somebody else try to help figure that out is amazing. Uh, all the people who attend my meetings and are available to me by email and phone when I come up against a language that I don't speak are amazingly helpful. And uh, Juliana starting that, starting that whole uh, commendations to commenters, I think I have now hit everyone who has been amazingly helpful to me. Um, really, one of the th one of the big things I wish I'd been able to figure out is how to make the meetings shorter. Uh, because in a big month, twelve. I'm not kidding when I say twelve hours. And uh, my brain is just pudding at the end of that. But yeah, no, I, Pelican is definitely a uh, team sport. So if you want to sneak a submission through, submit it through the West with a Z first name, so it's really late in the meeting? No, because I don't always do A to Z. I bounce around. Oh, and the proofreaders, because I am Pelican Queen of Typos. Oh, and I can't forget the submissions heralds. One of the good things about doing names is that we can fix things on the fly in a way you can't with Armory. So very often, either at the meeting or leading up to the meeting or sometimes after three days after the meeting, uh, one of my brilliant staff will have had an idea, chased it down, and saved the name that we didn't think we could find. But inevitably, the submitter has said no changes. And so I can't change that one letter to make it, uh, red to register it. So what I have to do is go back to the submissions heralds for that kingdom and have them reach out and chase down the submitter to get the consent. And you guys are all wonderful about handling that. And I rely on you so much. I cannot say enough good things about the submissions heralds I've worked with. Uh, okay, Patricia asks, do you wish more people would release their old names when they are gone through heraldic wills or at least file blanket permission to conflict when they are alive? Or is that more an issue with Armory and Wreath? Um, be we haven't had a lot of name conflicts recently and where we have, we've been fixing them on the fly. Oh, that's a conflict. Let's add an element. Uh, and people will happily slap of, lo of their local group onto the tail end of their name to get the name they want. And because we can do that without requiring a resubmission, it hasn't been that much of a problem for me. That being said, society is getting older and uh, people are going to stop being available for uh, permission to conflict. I have both a blanket permission to conflict letter and a heraldic will. So, and I very much encourage you to uh, do the same. It's just polite. All right, I have a half hour. Uh, now that we are halfway through, what topic hasn't come up that you expected people to ask about and what do I have to say about it? 
Uh, well, I expected I was going to get a lot more yelling about Nazis. Uh, and a lot more people with things to say about the proposed offensiveness rules. Um... Cormac is <laughs> So, uh, yeah, surprise Nazis. Um, for a while now, I have actually been Googling German names. Uh, after, a ins after a moment with a submitter where a perfectly period given name, you know, German name ended up being the name of a concentration camp commandant. So after that, which happened while I was still Blue Tiger, um, I had kind of already been Googling German names to double check. And we should be Googling name submissions for presumption issues anyway. Um, I'm, I'm not crazy about offensiveness by association because it's very hard to get, it's such a slippery topic. I know there are people who really hate me for deciding that de Torquemada is not offensive because it's a town and the town itself is not offensive, just the one dude from the town. But I, I am, I'm not liking that we have to do it, but I recognize that we have to do it. And so we have offensiveness by moral offensiveness language. In the Palimpsest letter for June, if you haven't read it and commented on it, go out and comment on it. In the May cover letter, there will be a list of 68, I think was the final count, of the major Nazi camps that we have determined are banned outright from being used in names. Uh, some of them were a little surprising to me. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of names using those elements already registered. And uh, yeah, this is why we can't have nice things. I feel badly for the people who just want to do German and Eastern European recreation and for the people who want to do recreation in the areas that were occupied territories because it's certainly not like the Poles wanted to have concentration camps in their country. So, yeah. I do not envy my successor who will have to grapple with how to actually apply this stuff in practice. Uh, Maddock asks, if the Kingdom Submissions Herald works with a client to adjust name issues before the letter goes external, do you want us to produce a new form or is dealing with the interactions in the head matter sufficient? I do not want you to produce a new form, I want you to explain in the LOI what changes were made and that the submitter consented. Uh, Herveus, how do you know that a will that calls for release is ripe to be executed if there was no one named in the will as executor? Uh, well, I solved this by writing in my mundane will uh, that my, exe my mundane executor has the obligation to notify the Laurel office that I'm dead. I suggest that if you're releasing stuff upon your death, you do the same. Uh, Otherwise, we'll just find out when we start looking for the person for permission to conflict. 
That and was sort of a leading question, a trick question of sorts. Okay. Uh, someone will know they're dead. Lily asks, where are you in the this is offensive spectrum? Oh, I am not a good representative sample of what's offensive. I am mortally hard to offend and tend to err on the side of one should respond to bad speech with more speech. So I never use my own personal barometer for whether something is offensive. And I grew up in New Jersey where profanity is uh, a way of life. So no, I never use my own personal taste as a barometer. Shauna asks, what decision did you make at the beginning of your tenure do you wish you had not made? I don't know that there's a decision I wish I had not made. I mean, I'm pretty content with what I've done and how I've gotten there. There have been no unintended consequences. I mean, yeah, the Finns are, a, you know, informed me I was a colonialist imperialist because I wouldn't let them register modern Finnish. But I still don't even regret that because I think it was the right decision. Then we made How about the other sovereigns. What was that? How about previous sovereigns' decisions that you don't like? Anybody made? Is there any previous ruling that has been a, a made a problem for you? No, I just reversed it. If it was a major problem, <laughs> good. As or rather, I, should I say, if it was a major problem unsupported by data? Okay. The data data always wins. Right. Uh, oh, Julia asked, and yes, you're right, I did skip you, I'm sorry. Uh, what is my favorite decision so far? Huh. Actually, honestly, I'm more proud of the uh, of some of the stuff I got Lilia to do by providing data than of decisions that I made myself because mostly I'm just interpreting other people's work. Uh, the fact that we can combine 16th century German and English now, I'm pretty pleased with that. Um... Yeah, I have to say I'm more proud of stuff I did research-wise than of decisions as such. I got 15 minutes. Uh, no, I have never actually colonized Philly. Alton of Grimfells was Lilia's work, and I think Juliana's tenure. What, who was sovereign in 2010? Um, might have been Harry. I don't remember. No, that was Lilia mostly. Yes, we share a brain and we're functionally indistinguishable. Uh, it is our longstanding joke in meetings that pelicans are like the Bene Gesserits from Dune and all of the pelican sovereigns of arms share a share a brain and consciousness and knowledge. And therefore, when any of the, uh... ah, there we go. Yep, it was, uh, it was Mari then. Because it was 4 2010 was Alton of Grimfels. What is the funniest name I had to pass because it met the rules? Shipwreck. I would have to say shipwreck. Uh, well, anyway, during Pelican meetings, if any combination of 
me, Lilia, and Juliana say, you know, say the same thing at the same time, we have to drink. And it happens more than you'd think. No, you know, it would have been, it could have been Ari, because it's 4-2010 was the letter it was on, so I don't know which one of them it was. But no, that was not me or Lilia. Although Lilia did the research. All right, last 10 minutes. Bueller? Awards orders, how do I suss out documentation? Uh, I read the articles. I, uh, I do the analysis. I run the numbers. It's a flow chart. Order names are far less difficult than household names because there's a very finite number of order name patterns. Uh, and really, like I said, it's just a flow chart at that point. Uh, ba, ba, ba. what are my plans for retirement? Um, getting back to commenting and doing, and doing research. And, uh, have LOR more joke names being registered for real. I don't know that it's led to more joke names. I mean, it's certainly led to, whoop, I just lost the chat channel. How did I do that? There we go. It certainly led to some joke names being registered. Uh, there we go. Hang on. Um, actually, if anything, the April 1st LOIs have led to people getting excited about heraldry. And while it will lead some of them to going to register the joke names, it also leads some of them to actually be interested in researching and um, I just did the wrong thing. Uh, researching and getting involved. It's been very good from a, from a, uh, I want to say propaganda, but that's not what I mean. From a publicity, public perception of the Herald standpoint. Uh, people love them who are not heralds. Uh, they look forward to them and come read them every April 1st. So, uh, by and large, I'll pay the price of a couple joke names being submitted for real for the, uh, for the publicity benefits. What am I looking forward to post Pelican after I step down again? Being able to do names research and consults and commentary again. Uh, I actually really like working one-on-one -on -one with the submitters to get them what they want. Um, I like the collaborative creative process of working directly with the submitter, and I have missed doing that. So, uh, it's 8.51 here, which means it's... Ten fifty. I was doing running the numbers in my head, so we got five more minutes before we should wrap up. Um, uh, 
So my question for you folks is where are all my name commenters? Come comment, I need more than the same four people. Yep, yeah, well, I'm not blaming you. Allison's one of the same four people. I can't rely on, you know, Allison and uh, Lilia to, to do things. Yeah, Ragged Staff's been a little busy. Is there a current fandom that accounts for many of the unregisterable problem names these days? There aren't that many unregisterable problem names. Um, I mean, about every three letters will get something completely out there. But mostly it's gaming terms. But it's not like any one specific game. It's just sort of video gaming communities. Surprisingly, most of the Game of Thrones names are documentable. Um, yeah, I can document 90% of the Game of Thrones surnames. So, internet memes occasionally. But we actually don't have that much. Really? There's been a lot of good research and a lot of good submissions coming in. And I will happily swallow one way too cutesy joke name or so a month for all the really good stuff we're getting. The level of research overall is uh, pretty excellent. And oh, mixed English and Gaelic is just my personal thing I hate the most, and which we would stop doing. Do you think they've been weeded out at the local slash kingdom level? I don't know. I haven't really read KLOIs in a, four years, so I think just in general, there's so much, it is easier to have good information. You can get a really good authentic name with only the internet as your resource. We're no longer dependent on uh, everybody owning certain books. Uh, advice for my successor? Keep a good team. Your team will keep you sane. Uh, the quota on Norse and Gaelic names um, was in the April the April 1st cover letter. I have no idea why it hasn't been implemented. <laughs> that was our contribution to the April Fool's letter this year, is the Sovereigns put in some of their favorite moments. I'm still, I uh, would really like to do the uh, roll a d20 for your new language. Uh, level of research is good for most of Europe, but not for all cultures. That seems to be a PR issue for us, too. Any idea if we could do something? We actually are doing several things. Um, I reached out for people who were interested in doing non-European work. Uh, I dropped the ball a little on kicking all of them into play, simply because real life got away from me even before the pandemic hit, but I fully intend to follow up on that and start teaching the people who do have that information in the SCA how to write name articles and getting them involved in commenting in things. Um, so, and try to just get more information out there. Um, so there we go. We are actually doing things. It just, it moves slowly because 
because life happens and we're all volunteers. All right, well, thank you everyone. I got great questions. Uh, thank you for not coming at me with pitchforks and torches. And um, always feel free to email me with any questions. I'm going to stick around because I'm attending the next class in this channel. Um, well, thank you for a wonderful session. That was fantastic. Uh, are you okay with me hitting the stop record button now? I am perfect. Thank you all very much.